Hello there. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. Very happy to have you here with us. Hope you're enjoying the Horses India meeting 2021. It's an absolutely phenomenal lineup of speakers and sessions. This session in this panel, we will discuss more workers are needed to train AI. We have a very strong panel here. Let me introduce them to you. We have Martha Bletcher. She is the General Counsel Protocol Labs of USA. Protocol Labs, I'm sure all of you know, it's an open source R&D lab that is intricately developed, involved in the development of Web 3.0, right? So they build protocols, tools, services to radically improve the internet. Hopefully, we'll see more of their action going forward. We also have with us uh, Tufi Saliba, CEO of Toda.network. Toda IP is a resiliency-first internet protocol. It enables P2P implementations in a complete autonomous decentralized governance setting. That sounds impressive, right? I'm sure some impressive work is happening at your end, Tufi. Welcome to both of you. We Thank are you. also waiting for two other panelists to join us, but we will commence our discussions. We, have, we will have with us Tejpreet Chopra, President and CEO of the BLP Group India. Bharat Light and Power it's, it's the full form of that acronym. It's one of the leading renewable energy generation and technology companies in India. Apart from generating renewable energy, TP also does a lot of work in renewable technology. And we'll have with us Jithin VG, the CEO of Acubits Technologies USA. is a full service software provider offering product development and digital transformation services to governments, tech startups, Fortune 500 companies and businesses. That's your panel. My name is Alokesh Bhattacharya. I am senior editor of the Economic Times in India, which is India's leading business uh, daily newspaper. And uh, I will moderate the discussion. So let us begin. And uh, as the other panelists join us, they can join the discussion. I'll start with uh, Marta. Uh, let us uh, start with some opening remarks from both of you on the subject, uh, more workers needed to train AI. Marta first, then, uh, then to two. Sure, awesome. So uh, I'm super excited to be here, and thanks so much for, for having me and for moderating the discussion. Um, so, you know, I, I really come at this from the legal perspective. Um, as a lawyer who's been working in the emerging technologies space, um, you know, we were, we were talking beforehand, um, a lot of my work is in specifically developing Web3 and developing blockchain technologies um, that go along with Web3 and decentralized storage networks. But I think it's a very similar, it's a very similar sort of set of issues to the legal issues around AI in the sense that you have a bunch of regulators in this space who uh, really don't understand the technology, but but do understand the impact that it's having or do understand rather that it is having an impact. Um, and I think that's doubly true for AI um, as it is for cryptocurrency. So like in the cryptocurrency context, you see, you know, you see sometimes there are crypto scams or sometimes you see people losing their money. And as a result um, of just not having a full understanding of the technology, you'll often have, uh, you'll often have uh, regulators who, um, uh, sort of uh, overreact and 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 uh, end up trying to ban it. So we were talking most recently in India about the proposed ban on cryptocurrency that um, ha is is currently going through the legislature um, and and looks like it may well pass. So you have this very popular technology with a lot of promise um, that's being sort of stamped out by regulators. And um, I think that there are a lot of uh, I think there are a lot of uh, parallels between uh, what's going on in India with cryptocurrency and what may end up going on um, it, from a legal perspective with AI, particularly when you're talking about uh, an eco economy that is so, um, you know, that, that would be so affected potentially by um, this sort of AI revolution. Um, and, and I think uh, one area to really look out for is um, how regulations are going to affect the space. Thank you, Marta. In fact, uh, you hit the button right away. You know, uh, it's so very important in India. We are seeing, you know, we were just discussing before we went live that uh, India has been seeing a lot of military action. And uh, it's good to see action. That means uh, people are interested in that space. They want to make it better, hopefully, right? And not just ban things, uh, everything that they don't understand. And uh, hopefully understanding will improve. And uh, even uh, the ecosystem should improve, of course, before regulators let things get better. Tofi, your opening remarks. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I'm uh, the CEO of Toda Network. I'm uh, the, the author of uh, Toda IP protocol, uh, which is a protocol that it's capable of uh, 
handling peer-to-peer -peer communication uh, for value uh, without having to uh, depend on a third party such as uh, Ledger or you know a bank or whatnot. And at the same time, I also uh, chair the IEEE um, AI protocol for security. Uh, and IEEE, for those that don't know, is uh, the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity, all humanity. So it uh, doesn't have any political agenda. Uh, and with that, we have um, uh, received a host, which is uh, South Korea, uh, for, for, for the main research center. Uh, and we will be uh, propagating across the globe fully. Uh, we'll, we'll be making an announcement for about uh, 14 board members, uh, and it's uh, the main responsibility is for uh, AI protocols for security. So as opposed to using AI for security, this is more how to secure AI, because uh, uh, AI can, can have a lot of security that you can look at it from attack from outside, but this is more... Uh, how to prevent an attack from within, uh, which means that if you are running AI, how can you prove to your audience that you're not attacking them or whatnot? Um, if you were to repurpose it today, AI can be the most dangerous weapon against people just by simply repurposing it. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's we we hope that we can have a sufficient research that can prevent uh, attack from within. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I do. Those are the two main things that I do, uh, and uh, my day-to-day -day work is all with Toda. I'm involved with over 20 companies. I sit on the board of about uh, 14 of them, so I'm a bit busy. <laughs> I'm sure you are. We'll come to you on the question on how to prevent attacks from within because you're the best place person to answer that question, right? But uh, I'd really like to start off this uh, session with uh, with the question of the topic that we are talking here about is uh, more workers are needed to train AI. You know, I had uh, read up a story a long time ago, maybe about three years ago, and uh, a lot of people are scared about AI, right? They are not really very comfortable, uh, including some famous names, right? Uh, without taking names here, but uh, I had read up that, uh, uh, and at that time, IBM's Watson was uh, the state-of-the-art uh, supercomputer, right? And these days, there are far superior ones. Apparently, a group of scientists had uh, had a secret meeting somewhere in the Amazon, in the Amazon in Latin America, not the website, right? And uh, and the only agenda there was to discuss the threat that uh, Watson poses to humanity. That is the kind of fear that AI sort of generates among a lot of people, right? I'm sure you would have heard of that. The thing is that if more workers are needed to train AI, because AI is nothing but augmented human intelligence, it is not artificial intelligence. It's not intelligent on its own. The intelligence comes from us and from us means we are such a huge variety of people across the world forget about the world even in India there are like more than a thousand languages in this country 1000 languages that many cultures that many you know some X of that subcultures so this thing of training AI to understand intuitively certain things you know what are the kind of jobs that you think are going to open up here? I can already see from Mata that there's a legal job aspect of this job that's going to come forward, of course. And the CEO job is not very common. It's like only one person gets it right in the whole organization. But apart from that, what are the other jobs that are going to be generated? What are the kind of people who can do these jobs? What are the skill sets that they're going to need? I really need to understand these things from you. Yeah, so um, it's it's super interesting in in the legal context, right? Because when you're creating, you know, there there's so many things that happen for 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 legal contracts that are very very rote. You know, you you've it's you it's it's sort of like you train someone to do something, and the amount of actual thinking that needs to happen is relatively small, um, and so you know, you can imagine, like most contracts, a lot of it is really boilerplate. Um, a lot of it's really boilerplate. And um, you can absolutely imagine situations in which um, this type of technology could replace lawyers in that context. Um, you can also imagine, um, you can also imagine, and this is, an, this is another area where it isn't necessarily specific to legal technology, 
but um, it has a lot of legal implications. Um, one of the things that often happens is, you know, you have these particular classifiers and you want to be able to show an AI a particular picture of a thing and you want it to be able to classify like, oh, that, you know, for example, the, 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 the typical example is like an iris flower. You want to be able to tell it, you want it to be able to show it a picture of an iris and have it figure out the um, the specific species of iris that it is. But in order to do that, you have to have a data set that you feed it. You know, you have to feed it this data that says this is this kind of iris and this is this kind of iris and it'll see patterns and figure that out. Well, who yeah. puts together that data set? So what ultimately ends up happening is a lot of the place where the legal implications of AI come into play is the, who is the owner of that particular data set and um, who owns that particular um, sort of style and arrangement of the data. So that sort of is, is w uh, one place where you really see it meeting uh, the legal world. Okay, Tofi, your view? Uh, so um, you've mentioned the fear uh, from AI and, uh, and I think uh, we humanity, we fear the unknown. Uh, we've known that uh, for quite some time. Um, however, uh, not a lot of people paying attention to the real fear of AI is not uh, AI vs a human, or at least we should say before we get there. Um, if AI is managed by a certain entity, uh, and that entity happens to be your enemy, Mm -hmm. If it's not your enemy today, maybe it's your enemy tomorrow. Um, if that AI has uh, some power uh, that it's more powerful than you are at certain tasks, um, today it might be 10 times more powerful, tomorrow it's 100 times more powerful, at some point it's a trillion times more powerful. That entity that it's managing, that AI, uh, Today, it might be doing it uh, to service you. Tomorrow, if it can repurpose it, it can use it against you. Um, so this is the kind of danger that not a lot of people paying attention to. Sometimes uh, also uh, unintended consequences of uh, AI that it starts going in a certain direction because it's designed to do a certain thing. Uh, and it's something that it's happening in the world today that not a lot of people paying attention to. But if I tell you what it is, you'd be like, uh -huh. um, we, we live in a time with the largest bifurcation of humanity. And that bifurcation is unintended consequences of AI. Uh, no matter what anyone tells you, this is not some sort of like conspiracy theory that somebody's like sitting behind a certain plan to get people to not believe in vaccine versus other people to believe in vaccine, for example, or to have certain people to believe that this virus is real versus this virus is not real or whatnot. Um, we've seen things in the past where, you know, people, they're entitled for their own opinions, but right now we're seeing it a lot more, that bifurcation in, in how AI is driving it. Uh, so. AI is uh, managed by a lot of corporations, and it's, uh, it's the main driver, the carrot, is to get you to click more. So if it's going to get you to click more, and it notices, uh, let's say that, uh, you know, uh, Marta uh, received certain video suggesting that the vaccine is bad for you, and Marta would click on the video, would watch the video, and would like it. Another person would send the video to Marta or, you know, some article that is also that the vaccine is bad for you and she would like it as well. Uh, automatically, a lot of the recommendations that's going to come to Marta that they are around how the vaccine is so bad by a lot of researchers, phenomenal researchers showing facts of how the vaccine is so bad for you. And Marta, over time, she's going to be so convinced that the vaccine is bad for you. And, you know, by the time she's going to run into Vivek or Sunday or Sandeep or whatnot, they were on the opposite side, receiving how vaccine is so good for you. And they were receiving all of the information around that. 
um, they're not receiving it because somebody's telling them. It's because of the reinforced learning of AI about them and how it's adaptive and how it's making all of the recommendations. So uh, this is the very first time in human history that this bifurcation is driven by a machine and the carrot is in front of that machine more than ever. I mean, we've seen some kind of tiny little things like that before, but not like this. Uh, so if, if you were to use your imagination of how far this can go, uh, it can be a lot more dangerous than we've ever anticipated. And I know that you said uh, AI, it's just uh, learning from our own intelligence, but that does not mean that it's not going to supersede our intelligence. The algorithms that are out there uh, already can supersede our intelligence with certain aspects. Um, in, in, you know, Historically, we used to think that if you're able to remember things so well and say them, or if you were to calculate such an equation, then you are extremely intelligent. But we all know that the machine can do a much better job than any human today at those two tasks. Um, subsequently, it's capable of doing a lot better tasks at a lot of other things uh, by learning by not just from one person, by learning from many different people at the same time. Um, so learning from our own intelligence is also, there are a lot of algorithms that enable it to learn from nature as well which we're not capable of learning from that nature as much as AI. Uh, so certainly it's, uh, it's going to get to the point where it's a lot more intelligent than any human uh, at any given time. And, 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 and that intelligence is going to be a lot uh, faster and a lot bigger. Um, so I truly, truly think that the biggest fear is the governance of AI and how far that can go when you have intelligence that it's a trillion times uh, more powerful than you are, but it can be managed by your enemy. Just imagine that. Yeah, uh, Tofi, what I also wanted to know is, you know, uh, who is qualified to train AI, right? Because AI is something that you need to train, right, for it to work properly. Somebody's got to be sitting there and identifying the images. If there is an image, your interpretation, Marta's interpretation, and my interpretation of the same image might be marginally different, right? And that marginal difference will bring in a difference in the algorithm and in the eventual outcome. Who is the person who is qualified to do this? What are the kind of jobs that are going to be? Is it so, necessary that somebody who's got a data science degree or something is the only guy who can do this? Can I, sitting at home, a journalist who knows nothing about technology, can I sit at home and do this? Well, who are the people? The reinforced learning, I mean, uh, historically speaking, before we got into the machine learning, people would train it in a lab, and then with the machine learning, you gather explicit feedback. But most recently, the vast majority of AI, they're advancing a lot further than explicit feedback, where it's able to interpret your implicit feedback and the implicit feedback of Marta and so on and so forth. And it's also the very recent studies able to reduce the the mood reduction, for example. Because if you're in a very good mood and you're able to like certain pictures or whatnot more, you're not in a good mood. It's also their subjectivity reduction. Uh, and I, I've written about those maybe 12, 13 years ago, but I see, I've seen a lot of uh, folks that they're actually implementing them today. Um, so, so I think the training of AI is not necessarily by folks that you would hire. Uh, now, if you were to uh -huh. be looking for what kind of jobs AI is creating as opposed to eliminating, uh, we all know, for example, and uh, you've mentioned earlier legal, and Marta would know that there's a lot of AI systems that are eliminating a lot of uh, jobs in legal, but that does not mean it's, there's not the different kind of opportunities that are being created. So... The, the adapt, uh, because we're ad adaptive, we're able to adapt from one job to the next job and so on and so forth, which is beautiful, but the AI is always going to learn from whatever your new job is and try to eliminate 90 to 99% of it. Um, so, so I think if you were to think of like what new job is creating, it's perhaps people um, instead of combating AI, it should enable AI more, it should find whatever uh, thing that is missing in that global machine that you're capable of okay. fulfilling because you have creativity. Every human who's watching this 
you know you have some capability that the machine doesn't have yet. And perhaps yeah. that you, you, when you put in your Venn diagram, you can find your unfair advantage. By finding your unfair advantage, some machine is going to need that, and then you can monetize on that. So I feel like th those are the best jobs out there. Um, not saying that they will last forever. And, and Marta would tell you, like, you, maybe you should do something today, and a year from now, she'll be like, huh, I don't need to do it anymore because the machine is doing it. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very rapid, and people, they need to kind of uh, be adaptive very quickly and, and jump on what, what they can fulfill. Marta, you know, there is so many things that happen when there's people are training AI. Like I said, you know, if uh, the three of us were to interpret an image or interpret the, you know, the, the, even a single word when you say it, your tone tells you what you're actually meaning, right? You know, you can say now or you can say now, right? You say it in five different ways and it mean five different things. It's not possible for a machine to capture all that, correct? Now, we, it's not just a plain, uh, when you're thinking of plain vanilla, you're interpreting an image, interpreting a dialect. It's just like a two-dimensional thing. Whereas humans are very three-dimensional. I think this whole thing of training AI, you know, in, from my personal viewpoint, is also something that makes us realize how complex we are as uh, as a machine, right? Because ultimately, humans are also machines. And if you look at it that way, a variety of humans in this world, it is impossible for any machine to, you know, uh, recreate that. But uh, that is what we are trying to do. I don't know how far we will succeed in it. But there are also legal ramifications to whatever we do, right? You know, the way an American would uh, interpret something, the way an Indian would interpret it would be different. And the same technology which is in, uh, deployed in America, if it is deployed in India, might have uh, might cause some legal issues, depending on who has inputted, uh, you know, the training into the AI, AI system, right? So there are lots of legal ramifications for wrong data, or altered or biased data getting into AI code, right? So from, from a legal understanding, because you are also involved with the company that is developing the next stage of all of this uh, high tech that's happening out there. Are we really prepared to deal with what's coming, right? Because right at this very beginning, even this minor small things, the regulators and the authorities are unable to comprehend a lot of things. What is the way forward? Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. I mean, I think one of the things that you're touching on um, is the the potential bias in AI, and um, that's something that we've already seen in the legal context specifically. Um, so there, for example, um, there is a uh, so Amazon was training a particular. Um, uh, uh, it wanted to have an AI that would look through all of the resumes that it received and decide which people should be interviewed. Because, you, you, know, you know, you would think, well, there ought to be patterns, for example. Um, you know, you should be able to you should be able to see patterns and the AI should be able to pick that up and, and choose who to interview. Well, it turned out that, you know, based on the data set that the Amazon uh, received, uh, they, it ought, the AI learned that if, if the word, um, women was in the title, like if it was like, you know, women's rugby or, you know, the women's club of whatever, uh, it would, uh, demote them in the pile or, um, you know, or if it, the certain, certain all women's colleges, um, you know, Mills college or another women's college, it would, uh, demote them. So, you know, you, you do get these biases that are baked in, um, and that has also happened um, in the legal context. So, for example, um, we actually uh, use, like, particular algorithms when we're talking about um, certain, uh, in, in certain places in the United States, we use it for parole. Um, and um, I, I think that that's, like, another area where, having a type of bias is, is so potentially problematic um, and something that, you know, you really, I mean, uh, protecting against that, I think, ought to be a pretty high um, high priority. And you can imagine that really having some legal implications. All right. That's good to know. Uh, meanwhile, I've got a message that TP is about to join us. So hopefully, you know, we'll see him soon. And uh, so let's move to the next part. And Tofi, you can, you know, tell us a little more about this because you are really the hotshot takeover. You know, when we are talking about training uh, AI, 
is it really possible you know to customize ai to the variety of dialects and languages and cultures and subcultures that we have in india as a country or america as a country is so diverse in culture such a cosmopolitan uh, nation right or any other country you take there is always a variety of people speaking different languages different variations of each language different cultures practices habits rituals right everything how is it possible for ai to capture all this well uh, i think um, at the end of the day the incentive uh, mechanism needs to be built in uh, properly uh, if you really want it to capture uh, because at the end of the day if you find that you don't have the incentive for it to capture you're not going to do it so you really need okay. to, that that carrot uh, we call it the carrot right you put the carrot and you need to kind of chase the carrot and and um, with uh, ai if you have a monetary incentive for example not to capture all of them but to capture 20% certain 20% um monetary incentive to who uh, the 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 so there's a machine that's going to have make money that the okay. incentive of that machine is let's say to capture 20% and ignore the other 80 unfortunately mm -hmm. we live in a world that is driven by that incentive no matter what anyone tells you and how nice it's going to be and what not it's if we don't bake that incentive within it's just going to do something that it's driven towards that chasing that carrot um mm -hmm. in my, i mean from my perspective my specialty i, I try to uh, incorporate the security by design by adding a lot of cryptography so then there's a requirement uh, can still be accomplished in a certain way to service uh, the maximum amount of uh, humanity, if not everyone. We try for everyone, but sometimes it's just not going to do for everyone. Um, so uh, cryptography, I think, is going to come to the rescue here. And, and if you have a certain requirement that it uh, doesn't have that strong security, and what I mean by cryptography, it's like, imagine you're running a certain AI that it, it's not going to get the reward unless it finishes what it's intended on finishing. So it, it ends up working, I'm not sure if you're familiar, for example, with the proof of work for Bitcoin. Uh, the proof of work, the, the machine has to do certain work. Although currently the work uh, in, in Bitcoin, I mean, it's uh, the exploitation on Bitcoin got it to what it's at today, where where the work is so um, redundant. It's basically just guessing numbers. But let's imagine that the actual work is an AI work. And the example that you gave earlier, so let's say you send an image to a marketplace of a bunch of AIs, let's say 50 machines. One of them is Amazon, one of them is Tencent, another one is Google, whatnot. If those machines, they're trying to sort a bunch of images in a certain way and you have billion images. Now you are the client. You're paying the thousand dollars, let's say, for the sorting. If okay. the, one of them is gonna give you the sorting before the other ones, you're going to reward that thousand dollars, okay? But the problem with that, that the, the other 49, they're doing the work, they didn't really get paid that time, but every time you're going to pay that other machine, the machine that is going to win, it's, it's like one, one winner takes it all. Um, but if you have a certain marketplace where they can complete each other's work and, it, and it's reinforced by cryptography, then the, that proof of work, that one person, let's say, will, or one of the, those machines will come and give you the first 10 and the second machine will give you the subsequent 90, and then the next one will give you 900 and whatnot. Um, now they're racing to give you the aggregate of them. They're able to give you the results a little bit faster than what one of them would have given you in a parallel universe. And that's not something that AI scientists, in, in the present time, they're even thinking about. They're just thinking of how their AI is going to beat someone else's AI. But when you introduce cryptography in the middle, a la the proof of work at Bitcoin, but the work is actually work and not waste, then, then you can have an, an ultimatum where you can, in your example, insert those thousand languages and then have a lot of AIs that you kind of learn from them because the incentive is spread out across all of them and there's always going to be some engine 
incentivized to kind of decipher that 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 language. Okay, Marta, I'd like to hear from you also on this. You know, from an American perspective, right? Do you feel that uh, the training of AI to the immense diversity that's there in in the country is it possible? Is it necessary? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. The question about it makes me think of this um, this artwork, this AI artwork um, that was uh, this artist had basically handpicked this massive amount of tulips um, and made all made this sort of data set of tulips just absolutely in depth. Um, and and basically was trying to get the AI, like fed this data set in to the AI and tried to get it to spit out sort of the image of sort of like the prototypical uh, tulip. You know, like this is what a tulip looks like. This is the prototypical tulip. Um, and then the artist actually put up the um, just all of the, the the these pictures of tulips. And it was actually just like an absolutely massive amount um, like took up a giant wall, like, and so you could just sort of see the work that went into it. And so I think right. the point of the work was the point of the like artwork was, you know, it looks very simple and a thing comes out on the other end. Um, but the actual amount of work that goes into feeding a data set into AI um, can be very manual and can be um, extremely um, can be something that is is hard to actually hard to scale. Um, and so I yeah. think. Um, I think that that you know that's the question sort of reminds me of of, of that. Um. Okay, interesting. So, uh, Tofi, let me come back to you on the question that uh, on the point that you said initially, how to prevent attacks from within. You know, uh, the problem that I see there, you know, like uh, it is very, it has been demonstrated, right, by researchers that deep neural networks are not very difficult to break. Right. You put the wrong the pixel in the wrong place and it gives the wrong interpretation. You can wrongly detect cancer if the uh, scan is, uh, you know, input by a certain number of pixels. And all sorts of things can be done. You can get a, a self-driving car to crash into people instead of brave, applying the brakes. Right. So how can we prevent the kind of attacks from within as such? Ne not necessarily that they're necessary that all of these are deliberate. Some might be unintentional but they might still have the same consequences, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the unintentional consequences, uh, we've noticed a lot of those uh, things that are happening in the world today. And I uh, feel that uh, uh, there, there are always going to be a problem that we all humanity work towards so uh, solving. Um, the, the fear is more, more so of how the attack uh, can be from within and a successful attack uh, using AI uh, is not going to resemble like the old uh, cybersecurity attack where you'd be like, oh, hey, we've been hacked. Uh, yeah. A successful attack is the one that will attack you without having you, you know, realize that you've been attacked. You would think uh -huh. it's a feature. You would think it's like, oh, wow, look at that. I can buy a new phone and it's, it's, it's got this app on a new phone. And if I were to install this app, it's going to help me to sleep seven and a half hours. That's fantastic. You start with that. And it's, it's providing you with that service. An attack from within would come that certain researcher would come in, provide that company with the ability to, let's say it, it was sending certain kind of sound to kind of keep you to sleep, um, you know. The researcher will, will, will embed additional sound to kind of for you to feel euphoric when you see an ad from Nestle. And Nestle would pay millions of dollars for something like that. And it's been proven that that research is not going to hurt people initially. It starts with okay. that. But then that's repurposing what was initially intended to do without necessarily having to harm the user. Initially, it's not harming. But that same direction can lead to something that it can harm millions if not billions of people if the attacker knows how to manipulate it you know if you, if you were to say it's like okay well you you, you were a very successful app we ha we were able to put 
one billion people to sleep. And then by injecting certain sounds, they're going to be feel euphoric when they see the ad from Nestle. It's not harming anybody. The next researcher will be like, hmm, I'm going to inject some additional sound where it's going to make people feel suicidal tomorrow. And then you suddenly have one billion people feeling suicidal. Or, or that, that would sound malicious. Now let me give you an example that's going to sound not malicious at all, but you're not going to accept it today. But in 10 years, you're probably going to accept it. The other example would be, I mean, let, let's say you're managing that AI in Los Angeles and the mayor of Los Angeles will come and say, like, you know, uh, the suicide rate's gone up so high. Can you do something about it? And then you hire that similar group of researcher and then we'll start injecting certain sound or whatnot that it's going to provably reduce that suicide rate. Then that same research through wristband or through certain thing that it's injected in you one, one way or another, it's going to eliminate that suicide rate. Is that possible? And a lot of scientists will tell you, oh yes, it is possible. We're going to detect all the signals, we're going to eliminate the suicide. It's going to look heroic and you're probably going to win the Nobel Prize for it, but if you were to go back to what makes us human, it, just the feeling that you know that you can commit suicide is just going to give you a lot of power because you feel like if things are very bad, you can just go and kill yourself, okay? No, I'm not saying that you should. We don't want anybody to kill themselves. But having that ability, knowing that, it's just going to give you a lot of power. Now imagine that's taken away from you. And the folks that took it away from you, they've got a medal for it. So this is, this is what I mean by certain attack vectors that would come in. They would look like sheep, but they are actually the wolf. Mm -hmm. it's taking that, if, if it's capable of taking that liberty away from humans, what else it can take? If you just use that imagination and you can see that uh, a successful attack vector would look like a sheep, would look like a phenomenal thing for you. But in reality, it might be doing something that you may not accept today. You're gonna, you're going to accept in ten years or whatnot. So, so yeah, I, I, I really caution people against the, the, the attack from within and repurposing AI. <laughs> okay, and uh, Mata, if you have some thoughts on that, uh, do add. Otherwise, I'll have another yeah. question for you. Yeah, I think that's really, I think that's a really interesting example, right? I think the thing that's thought of a billion plus people feeling suicidal makes me, you know, feel a little queasy. Well, right. I mean, right. But it's also not crazy. Like it's, it's not, you know, like, uh, as I think you alluded to, there was the, the recent example of sort of Facebook tweaking its algorithms to make a bunch of people feel sad. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they were intentionally like tweaking it as part of like a research thing. But as a result, there actually was this like massive amount of people who felt sad one day um, because Facebook could tweak the algorithms to show them a bunch of sad content. I'm like, look, did any of those people like, you know, like did that have adverse effects on any of those people? Like, you know, including self harm maybe. And like, what does that mean when you talk about, um, you know, algorithmic, you know, I think ultimately like there's this big question and the big question in the room is like, should there be algorithmic accountability? Um, like from a leap perspective, um, and um, and I see we have other another person who's joined us, so I will. Uh, right, yeah, right. Stop we only there. have five it's minutes. We, we talked a lot, so you know, such free yeah, yeah. of yours. <laughs> this week, TP. Okay, he's gonna oh. vanish again. <laughs> he's gone. TP, is your camera there? Are you there? Let me just check. Okay, I think he has a bad connection. Yes, but uh, uh, this uh, thing of uh, AI taking away jobs and all. What's your view on that? I mean, uh, for uh, okay, let's see if TP is back. I'll ask him the same question. Yes. Hi, TP. Welcome, Hi, welcome. Okay. So uh, you know we have discussed a lot of things, but uh, really what I wanted to come to you with is the India perspective uh, on AI, right? And the fact that uh, we are training uh, uh, Indian workers training AI is different from you know uh, workers in other. Uh, cultures uh, training AI. Uh, so two things I'd really like to know from you. One is, uh, do you think AI is uh, AI and its applications are are they appropriate or applicable in a country like India or in other 
comparable economies where there is such a huge population and there are very labor labor intensive kind of right even on a per capita basis so uh, that is one and do you think that a larger indian input will bias uh, ai systems and no first of all alokesh thanks so much for having me on the show i think ai is doesn't really matter whether which country or what people or where which industry or what sector is going to affect all of us in every sector in every country around the world and i think people and companies have to ignore it at their own peril because at the end of the day i think it's going to be even more important in countries like ours for a couple of reasons one is the fact that post covid from an industry side of things there's no doubt supply chain is broken and therefore companies across india are trying to drive productivity by using iot and ai ai technologies in manufacturing two is the fact that i think in order to drive the next level of productivity in manufacturing or it doesn't matter what industry the only way one can do that is to actually start adopting iot and ai technologies uh, across different sectors and three it's really it doesn't matter which sector you are in whether it's in auto industry or chemicals or energy the only way that we can make machines smarter the only way you're going to drive cost efficiencies or quality or reliability is bringing in this level of uh, uh, automation into the whole process and i'll just leave one last thought in this it's five things that are really driving this dramatic change that's happening all over the world one is the introduction of the cloud the clouds giving the scalability that we've been all desiring over a long periods of time at very affordable prices two is sensor prices are coming down dramatically so our ability to extract the right data is becoming much easier three is the fact that high performance compute once upon a time was only with a few companies the ibms of the world but today all of us on this call have access to the same high performance compute as the large corporations used to have the fourth thing is mobility today i can get data from a wind turbine in romania italy or germany for virtually free or any corner of the world that we weren't able to do a few years ago and the last thing at least in india we have that human capital but the human capital to my point allocation is the key because our big challenge is how do we find the right skill sets and people who have the depth of data science and knowledge to really make this revolution happen back over to you alokesh right so tp since you joined uh, you know, late and last let me ask you the next question also which is something that we have already uh, uh, discussed a little bit i uh, just wanted to know from you because your company is also dealing a lot with high tech uh, stuff right uh, your view on what kind of people really are suited to train ai is it necessarily the technology geek or somebody who's got you know uh, somebody who's got a technology degree or understands high tech understands ai or it can it be anybody can it be somebody like me my wife my mother right alokesh that's exactly what we're trying to do at industry.ai just think about it 650 billion dollars goes in unplanned downtime across manufacturing across the world and industries are contributing to 20% of the global carbon footprint and therefore while the geeks and these few guys who really understand all this stuff are few and far between however what we are really trying to do is to figure out how to democratize this technology because at the end of the day the question is how do we take this technology down to a point where we can really send it out whether it's a small scale company or a large 100 billion dollar company is what we try to do so what we're doing is we're rolling out our technologies in terms of driving productivity in manufacturing to all the large corporations in the world but at the same time trying to figure out how do we bring it down to a cost point so that even the factory floor guy who doesn't need to know anything about ai can we build these algorithms that put them into the machines into the controllers of the machines so that it can really develop these algorithms can run truly on the edge that it can warn the factory worker that the oil is going to be changed or the vibration in the machine is wrong or stop the machine right now because the gearbox is going to fail and that's the journey we're on alokesh is how do we bring it down to the factory floor worker who doesn't need to understand what ai is or how do you develop these algorithms but it's already built into the actual machine but let me just state a very very important point alokesh for all this to work it's not only about the geeks who develop the algorithms we need the partnership between the domain experts somebody who's made steel for 40 years of his life or somebody who's made cars for 50 years of the life there's no way us guys to understand data science to understand the industry well so in order to make this revolution happen you need the domain expert for a person like yourself whether you're a journalist or you need the domain expert for a person who's made steel 
to work with us to understand how do we make the connectivity level happen and how do you deploy these algorithms down to a point where at the end goal is how do we drive productivity and efficiency in manufacturing and industries across the world. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, we are over time now, right? We are supposed to end two minutes ago. So we will close this panel. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to the people hey, who listened. Thank you all. Nice there. to meet you. Thank you all very much. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Thank you. Be well. Absolutely. All right. Goodbye. Thank you.